Jaime Hawkins Jr. has been one of the best rookies in the NBA, so we talk about Wes's latest piece for the ringer on Jaime's evolution, earning his opportunities with the Heat, and interviews with Jaime Hawkins Sr., Eric Spolstra, and much more. Plus, what can we expect from Jaime for the rest of the season and beyond? We answer that and more on today's episode of Locked on Heat. You are Locked on Heat, your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome to Locked On Heat, your daily podcast on the Miami Heat. I'm Wes Goldberg, editor at allunionheat.com. Joining me as always, it's longtime NBA reporter David Rommel. However you're tuning in on YouTube, Odyssey, or your favorite podcast app, thanks so much for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Got a great show for you today. It's Jaime Hakez Jr. Deep Dive Day. We're going to get into my story about him for the Ringer preview. David's interview with him from All-Star Weekend in Indianapolis. But let's start with the story I wrote for the Ringer. Um, it went up on Tuesday. I, I want to talk about it. And so I, I'm trying to get into this in the less, uh, the least self-aggrandizing way possible. But uh, David, what did you like about my story? What did you like about the work I did? <laughs> I think it was a great piece. <laughs> I think it really showed uh, a side of Jaime that I don't think a lot of people had taken into consideration. I feel like he really opened up to you, but also you were able to kind of pepper it with a lot of different interviews from his father Eric Spolstra, his coaches at high school and at AAU, to just really show that Jaime has worked to get to this point. Like he might have been a mid first round draft pick and, you know, four years at UCLA where he was a quote unquote star, but nothing came easy to him. And it just kind of not only does it show Jaime's individual journey, but I also think it really doubles down on something that we have talked about a lot is how perfect his fit in Miami. Mm. has been like I think I don't know that any other team would have been able to get the most out of him the way that Miami has I don't know if they would have felt as uh gravitated towards him the way that Miami was throughout the whole draft process but also just being able to maximize the tools he has and to give him the freedom to continue to explore his, I mean top draft picks are tasked with doing so much like either you're a bad team and you've got a star level player like, say, Victor Webanyama on the San Antonio Spurs, and you're asked to do everything, and nobody else is really good or complimentary enough to kind of help you win a lot of games or achieve high levels of success. But to think about Jaime being a mid round draft pick, having a big role, much bigger than anybody would have expected, I think, mm -hmm. maybe not what yeah. something that Jaime would have said, but you know, and then to still be able to contribute, to find your voice, to find your role. And to be able to impact winning on a team that wants to win, that's extremely difficult. And so kudos to him. Kudos to you for writing about that journey because Thank I you. think it was really, really well done. And uh, just that's that's what I liked about it is just showing how the process has taken place. I don't think Jaime expected to have such a big role this early. And talking with Eric Spolstra for this story, um, he mentioned, like, you know, they really liked him. And that was, that was very clear. I, I got into a lot of reporting in the pre-draft process and the draft night process from Miami's side. And they were really, they were locked in on him and they were really nervous that the Warriors were actually going to trade up in front of them and try to grab Jaime. They, the Warriors were also locked in on Jaime. Uh, they ended up obviously getting Podmensky with one pick after that. And they're very happy with that. He's ended up being great for, for golden state, but like the heat were kind of sitting there sweating. And so was Jaime Hawkes. Like you had Utah at number 16. They did not want to go to Salt Lake City. The Lakers were there at 17. They never really thought the Lakers were that interested, which just continues yeah. to underscore how badly the Lakers screwed that up, not taking the guy in your backyard uh, who would yeah. have an obvious fit on that roster. Like that's literally the kind of guy that they need on that team. But Miami was really, really locked in on him, and they were really excited to get him. Obviously, they would have went in other directions if Jaime was not available. But, um, you know, Eric Spolster talked about the pre-draft process doing his deep dive and saying how uh, what impressed him the most was how Jaime ended up going from role player his first couple of years at UCLA yes. to the star player who they were running the offense through by his senior year. And I do wonder if that's sort of how Miami envisions. All right. He can, he's a guy who could be a star player yep. and has the ability to lead a team, but he can also just fit a role and star in that role. And, and I thought Eric Spolstra said it really well. I asked him about, um, you know, were you surprised by how quickly he's gotten, uh, you know, accustomed to everything and, and how how he's just basically taken everything you've put on his plate and ran with it 
And here's the quote he gave me, and this is the one that appears in the story. It seemed like every 10 days or two weeks, that would be a natural progression to add more to his plate. And when we had injuries, so it, and then we had injuries, so it made sense to give him more responsibilities. And every time we did that, he handled it very well. He yep. earned it. And I think that to me is the most impressive part about Jaime beyond the footwork yes. and all the stuff is, okay, here's a new thing. We're going to run, we're going to run a post play for you in the opening game of the, the year in the fourth quarter when we need a bucket, we're going to, okay, good. Jimmy Butler's out for 11 games. Can you like Step score in. more points? Oh, right. Tyler Hero's out. Can you right. run the second unit? Oh, we're going to actually bring back our zone defense from last year's finals run, find a place in the zone defense. And he's done all of the, he's hit all those check marks. He's smart enough to have to figure it out. So you have to have the mental flexibility to, to be able to adapt to different roles and stuff like that. But I, I think what a big part of why he gravitated towards the Heat front office and the draft Knicks there is because of that evolution, the fact that he's come from where he has and he has that upbringing with a father who played high school, who coached him, you know, mm -hmm. at, at a high level. And then, you know, for him to grow into his role at UCLA and be able to embrace all the different you know, levels of, of a player, like from a role player to a star to the guy that there was the foundational piece for that team, you know, and to be there for four years, like these kinds of things all matter so much to the heat because they want guys who accept their roles and start in them when they get those yeah. op opportunities. Cause you never know when that could, you know, come into play. That's why they, they took a guy like Duncan Robinson, you know, took a chance on him because they saw something in him and, and he had a skill set that was in an elite level with Jaime. I don't think he ever had that, that elite skill necessarily his athleticism is fine but he doesn't shoot like an elite shooter he does he's not elite in, in terms of his quickness or anything like that but he just he accepts everything he can do everything and that's how he's functioned this year like there's so much versatility and impact to what he can do he can rebound he can push the pace he can bring the ball up he can dunk with in, in traffic you know there's a lot to he, what he can do and, and so there was that appeal there from that team. It's like, you know what? We need a fully made player. We're going to take a draft. We're going to take a draft pick in the first place. And we want that guy to be a contributor. Yeah. And I think that he's exceeded all their expectations because yeah. not only is he a contributor, but he's a pretty high level one at that. Yeah. I had somebody in Miami scouting department literally say we were looking for somebody who could make an instant impact. We just came out yep. with finals run and a cheap one because of the new yep. CBA and the whole life of sure. the second apron and everything like that. And in Jaime on that rookie scale contract is exactly that. Um, I found it also interesting kind of digging into his background at UCLA where, you know, he started there and he was not, people have this view of Jaime Hakez Jr. now as this yes. patient player with an old school <laughs> approach and a veteran style game. But everybody that I talked to, whether it was from high school, his high school days or AAU or his early days at college was like, that was not Jaime back then. Like we're talking about this slowed down back to the basket, Jaime Hakez Jr. with the patient footwork and the up fakes and all that stuff. That's kind of over the last two and a half years where that's yeah. really been a thing. And, uh, and you wouldn't see that he looked so, he looked so seasoned when he's doing those things, but early in his career, people were like, Oh, this guy was just like a, a, a rampaging bull. Like he was just diving on the ground, going for rebounds, a hustle can, yeah. player. Just, we, we couldn't slow him down. One quote that ended up, uh, uh, on the cutting room floor was like Mick Cronin was like, his UCLA coach was like, he traveled every time, like the, for, for the first month, every time he touched the ball at UCLA, he just <laughs> traveled. And it's like, that's how fast he was going. And now he's got such a slowed down game. I find that part remarkable about Jaime, how this is, this is not necessarily a natural thing for him, although it yeah. looks so natural. Well, I, I think, again, another appealing factor for the Heat and, and what they typically look for when they're evaluating players is the kind of work you do, not just on the court, but behind the scenes. And there was a great anecdote there from Cronin about how he, he just kind of locked himself in place during the, the pandemic. And it was just like, oh, this is the perfect time for me to concentrate on doing the work. And, and that's like right there, Eric Spolstra gets goosebumps right. just mentioning it. And so it's just like the idea of like wanting to continue to work. And, you know, I think at one point, the, it was at the uh, AAU coach, he said, we wanted to wrap things up and Jaime wouldn't yeah. let them. He just wanted to continue working through and putting up all, you know, shot after shot after shot and continuing to develop. So I, I think the idea of like, I recognize that I am not a great player and that maybe I have some things to overcome, but through work, I can overcome whatever liabilities I might be or whatever limitations I might have in my game. And that is just, it's so perfectly heat culture in that mm -hmm. sense. It's like, you know what? I went into this program with no, nothing expected of me because he wasn't even, a, and this is another point that we'll get to, he wasn't 
recruited by Cronin because he right. had taken over for Steve Alford, who had been fired before. He was the one who had recruited Jaime. And then Jaime came in there without any kind of expectation, without a clearly defined role, and he grew into it, and he developed, and he took the time, and he worked, and he made that concerted effort to develop his game, to be that you know back to the basket player, etc. So all that just screams heat culture so much. So uh, it's just again fantastic to show what Jaime has become yeah. and who he is, and I think he's going to become a, a great player in Heat history. We'll talk about his ceiling after this. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because right now new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and so much more. And you'll find it all when you go visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and shoot your shot. That's FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Oh, today's episode is also brought to you by LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. And that's why you've got to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. I know how difficult it can be when I had to hire people when I was working in PR. You take this time to go through all these resumes. Oh, can you have to confirm whether or not they have the skills that are right for you? Then you have to set up an appointment. LinkedIn takes care of everything. It's not just another job board. They've got a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to find somebody to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. And LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive and really is. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Imagine that, getting it all done within a day. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats, they might not have time or the resources to find the right hire, but LinkedIn helps out in so many different ways. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash LockedOnBA. That's linkedin.com slash LockedOnBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Thanks for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Make sure you are subscribed on YouTube and your favorite podcast app. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube. Subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Another thing that we wanted to get into on this whole Jaime Hakez Jr. story Yep. This idea that he's a vet, and that's kind of what attracted me to to report this in the first place. His old school approach, the veteran stuff, the low post work. Like, I asked him, like, why is somebody born in 2001 even mm -hmm. interested in practicing low post skills? And he's just like, he, he said, it's like jazz when you get down there and all these things and how the game slows was. down. <laughs> Wasn't yeah. it? He said that. And I was like, that's going in the story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm building a story around that. That might be my lead right there. I mean, right. It was really interesting how he talked about, like, just the versatility and, and it's, it's a cultural thing for him. Like it was really, really interesting. And he, he kind of, you know, and I think you brought up a great point how, you know, he, he, he grew up watching low post mastery from, from a guard type size and Kobe Bryant and stuff like that. So that was a really interesting. But the thing area. with that is you, you pull up Kobe highlights on YouTube because Hakez was nine when Kobe won his last championship, he was nine years yeah. old. You don't remember, you just remember him winning. Like, you don't know, like, Oh, I remember when I was eight years old, just watching Kobe work in the low post. Like no kid said, like, come on, <laughs> like that's not a thing. Uh, you just remember the winning and the the confidence and the the black mamba of it all and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And when you pull up highlights of Kobe, you don't see that kind of thing all the time. When you're pulling up Kobe highlights, you're seeing the dunks, you're seeing the game winning shots, and ditto for Michael Jordan and all that stuff. You really like that. I mean, that's the first stuff that comes up. You have to go like dive into Deep youtube dive. and find Watch game the footage games, and yeah. Yeah, yeah to find that stuff and that's what he want and that's what kept in he wasn't just like oh i'm just gonna keep pulling up these kobe dunks like that was right. not what he was doing when he was a teenager right. he was pulling up the games and doing that stuff he also mentioned to me that he used to study Dwayne wade carmelo anthony mm. was a big one shaquille o'neal with his footwork i found that interesting um people forget how great of a footwork guy Shaq was great drop step yeah yep and um so he was pulling up footage on all of these guys. And I just, I found all of that interesting and the whole old school approach of it. And when I brought that up, he kind of bristled at it 
at the fact mm. that he kind of is talked like a vet. And I remember when Jimmy Butler um, earlier in the season or, or in training camp was talking about Jaime. Right. And I included the the quote in my story. And it's just like, it's what everybody, he, Butler laid the foundation for how everybody was going to talk about Jaime for the rest of the year to this right. point. He says about Jaime, he just plays to win. He makes all the right plays. He plays like a vet. I think that's what the ex experience at the NCAA tournament gets you. He's very, very smart. He knows where the ball has to go. He's confident in his abilities and sticks to that. And he definitely plays to his strengths. And I don't disagree with anything that Jimmy Butler right. said. Like I said, he laid the foundation for how we were going to talk about Jaime for the rest of the year. And he said that in October. Um, but when I brought that up to Jaime, he kind of, again, he bristled at it. And he goes, so what happens when I'm a vet? What are they going to say? I think I just play like a basketball player, rookie, vet, whatever the hell you want to call it. It's just basketball at the end of the day. And I, I found that part of it. I just found it very in, uh, compelling how he's the one. Everybody's giving him praise for playing like a vet. They mean it in the best possible ways. And he's right. pushing up against it. He's like, well, then what are you going to say when I am a vet? And I think it brings up an interesting question. What does Jaime Hawkes look like when he's five, six, seven years into his career? Like, what are we talking about in terms of what his ceiling could be? Yeah, that's a really difficult question to answer because I, I don't, I don't know. There's no necessarily flashy aspect to his game, and so you can't just take that and and fine tune it. And then again, you know, he's already 23 now. He just turned 23. You can't just take that and extrapolate how he's going to develop that over the next five to 10 years or whatever, however long his career might last. And he does not also have like such incredible athleticism. He's athletic enough. Absolutely. Yep. So that's not enough, but it's not an elite athlete at the NBA level where you could say, once he fine tunes those, I remember talking about another slam dunk participant and Aaron Gordon as a, you know, a young player in Orlando when I was covering that team and just watching him and being like, if he can figure out, all these tools, he might be a good player someday. But right now, he's just like, I could jump out of the room. I can do all these things. But he was just moving at a, at a you know, he was moving at an uncomfortable speed because he he didn't, he, he didn't, as they say, let the, the game slow down for him. And he didn't know how to use those tools in the right way. But I don't think, it's not that Jaime, he just doesn't have those tools necessarily. He has lots of tools, other skills necessarily, but not like that athleticism that kind of puts him out of sync with how he could be. So it's just a matter of continuing to grow and getting more opportunity. So when I look at what he can be, I think he's going to be a star level player. I, I really do. I, I, maybe this is putting a ceiling on him, something that the heat don't want it to. I think he can be a multi-time all-star. I think he just needs that opportunity. And I think he'll get it in a couple mm -hmm. of seasons when whatever this iteration of Jimmy Butler finally runs its course and, and they wind up, giving the opportunity to Jaime alongside Bam Adebayo and perhaps Tyler Hero if he's still with the team. So, we, you know, there's so many things to take into consideration. But, you know, Jaime makes the most of his limited opportunity. But when those opportunities increase, so will his production because he's so steady in what he can do. And, and it's so what I we saw at UCLA, right? It was a limited right. opportunity. Come in, right. rebound, run the floor, dive for loose balls. And then right. by four years later, you're going to be the star of the team leading us to the Sweet right. 16, you know? Those and things don't go away, you know? Right. It's, that's what I've said before. It's like, you know, what's the counter to what Jaime does when he can do all those other things and yeah. packs winning, you know? So and I, it I goes to the whole point of like, hey, every time we, like Spolster were saying, every time I added to his plate, about two weeks <laughs> later, he'd be ready for more stuff. He'd be ready for right. more food on the plate. So just keep right. putting stuff on the plate. And who knows what four or five years down the road it looks like, right? What Jaime's game looks right. like. I... I don't want to put a ceiling on him. I This, to me, people say, oh, this is why you stay in school for four years. I don't think that that's the lesson from Jaime Akers Jr. He had ankle problems as a junior that slowed his momentum. Yeah. He would have come out as a junior. He tried to come out, out after his sophomore year, and they told him you're only going to be a second-round pick. Like, this guy wanted to make – like, this guy wasn't like, I'm a, I'm going to stand for the four-year guys here, and I'm going to make – I'm going to – no. It just yeah. happened to be his path. Right. But I do think there is something to be said about not eliminating those guys because they went to college for four years, like off your draft board, you know? And I think that I remember talking to Norm Powell about that. Like, yeah. why did he slip the way he did? And because he was a four year guy and he's still in the league. Like when a lot of other guys that weren't four year guys mm -hmm. were in the same draft class and they're still not in the league, 
here he is. So Steph it's, Dame, they stayed multiple years in college. Like right. I, I, we're just, it's sort of a new thing, and I feel like it's almost going to be like a bubble where you're only drafting like 18, 19, early 20 year olds, and and we're going to kind of cor- market correct a little bit here because yes. of guys like Jaime and other people that like Norm Powell and other success stories. But I, I, I think the thing that's also not being accounted for enough is I think we weigh too much the age and the athleticism part when we're scouting draft prospects and not enough the basketball feel and the coachability and the ability to learn more specifically. And that feel for the game is so important and I think more important than anything else, right? We've seen a lot of 6'8", 240-pound players who can run a 4'4", come through the draft and not be LeBron James. LeBron is not LeBron just because he is those things. LeBron is those is LeBron because of his basketball IQ and his feel for the game and the fact that he just wants to get better each and every single year. That's why he might be the greatest player of all time. Like, I think that thing is not accounted for enough, and I think Jaime's feel for the game is vastly underrated. And so I agree with you. I think this guy could be a multiple-time all-star if all things break right. Guys who were were not flashy, not the greatest athletes who made multiple all-stars, like Chris Middleton, like Jimmy Butler, who Jaime models his career after. Middleton made three all-star games. Yeah, but Jimmy he was, Butler's been in six. Like you yeah. can get there, right? Because if you just work, it takes on your time skill, too. It takes. Like, a think lot about of time. Middleton in, in, in Detroit. Like nobody even remembers that he was just kind of like, yeah, he was an, a mad player that right. nobody really cared about too much, and then he winds up finding the right, you know, comfort level out in Milwaukee and and, and uh, continuing to develop yeah. his game. So that's a, re- a really good point. Yeah. Who was it who said something about? You know, to tie into what you were saying about basketball field, I can't remember. I think it was Spo that the the recognition that he can make the right pass or something along to those effects, mm. like this understanding that was. he's got the vision, that he has the the feel for the game, as you talked about. Was it Spo? It was. It was Spo, and I it's, I was asking him about running that ATO in the first oh, game right. of the season in Detroit, and I was like, what made you comfortable running that play for him in that moment? Detroit at that point had scored like six straight points or something like that. They were threatening to come back into that game, and ultimately, we obviously remember how that. They, they came within a Cade Cunningham three-pointer of beating the Heat um, in that game. But he said, I felt comfortable because – I have the quote right in front of me. I'll just read it. Uh, that was one of the pleasant surprises about him was his advanced skill set. His footwork and fundamentals in the mid-post were really advanced. During Summer League, we also found out that he had good vision and could pass. So right. they kind of tested him in Summer League and training camp. And then by the time it was opening night, they were like, yeah, we're just going to put the ball in his hands and trust him to make the right play. Yeah, he was yeah, you again, that nine timeline, minutes though. into his NBA career. <laughs> but the, remember that time, like he showed out in the Sacramento so- summer mm, league. Yep, that was just a two-game affair, and then he wound up getting hurt and missed all of Vegas. So we didn't right. see him. I, I was there in Vegas, and I didn't get a chance to see him play at any point in time. And then training camp starts, and that's all you're hearing. Like aside yeah. from the buzz about Kyle Lowry and his starting and everything else like that, like we were just all hearing. Oh, this kid can play. We get the quote from Jimmy about playing like a vet. His old UCLA guy and Kevin Love saying, "Oh no, time is really showing out." Like he was wowing guys in training camp early on because he was an impactful player when you're not expecting him to be. So I mean, it's just that's just the belief. It's like you can be drafted in the in the, you know in the second or third year after your third year in college, but you're not expected to be an immediately impactful player. But Jaime, to his credit, has put the work. And, and developed his game to the point where he does know how to make an impact. And something that I talked about with him in, in uh, All-Star, you know, is that even when your shot isn't falling, as it hasn't fallen lately, there's still a way for you to become a really impactful player. And I, I think that's just what he has always appreciated and recognized in him. Uh, let's talk about that conversation you had with Jaime at All-Star. We'll do that next here on Locked on Heat. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Why would you want to get a part that don't fit your car? eBay has you covered. Because with eBay Motors, 
you're burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only and exclusions do apply. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Thanks for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. You can email us, LockedOnHeat at gmail.com. David, you caught up with Jaime Jaquez at All-Star in Indianapolis. The full interview is going to be up on our audio platform. So Apple, Spotify, Odyssey, wherever you listen to your podcast, you can listen to the full interview there because it's only audio-based. Ah, but we do have a snippet for you here. We'll play that now. When you say your shot's not falling, obviously that's a point of concern for you and everybody else, but, I mean, how do you kind of work past that and still have the comfort level to take those shots when they're available? I mean, I think it's just staying confident. I mean, I'm very trusting in my shot. I work on it every single day. I work it's improved. I can see, like, the it's yeah, fluid. Yeah, you know, 100%. And, I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, they don't fall. You go through a slump where, you know, it might feel great, and that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, everything's feeling great. I've been talking with all the coaches. Uh, sometimes they just don't go in, but no matter. You know, you still got to keep shooting. Um, you get, get yourself out of that, and so that's kind of where I'm at, just trying to stay confident, stay positive. Uh, my team and coaches have been a tremendous help, uh, helping me, you know, stay confident and positive, uh, especially during this time. And, you know, like I said, just trying to do things, you know, defend, rebound, other aspects of my game um, to try to elevate. Line of questioning, uh, David, Jaime had been in a little bit of a slump coming back from that groin injury. He did start to pick things up over the last couple of games starting to look more like himself. He mentions how the rebounding numbers were going up. Uh, I just noticed from my own eye test, like he was cutting a lot more off ball. He was just a little bit more active, obviously just sort of get a feel. And then he obviously gets the whole all-star break to recover. So um, are you, are you concerned about Jaime maybe hitting a wall here? Or do you think he just needed a little bit of a break? And and what does, what do you think this looks like coming out of the break? I think he's going to be fine. I honestly do. I, I think he, I asked him about the, you know, the concerns of the rookie wall and fatigue sitting in. And he said, they had been. He was starting to get to that point. But with the injury, you know, there's a blessing in disguise. And uh, players have talked about this before. Like, you know, not only do you get to recover in season as you're recovering from the actual injury, but fatigue is mitigated that way. But you're also able to see the game differently. You can see how you fit your role into it. And, and so I think for a, a player smart as Jaime, I think he's going to benefit from it. Uh, I think it was a great weekend for him to be able to continue to build his brand as a, a player, but also to get the rest he needs so that he can continue to be impactful because so much of his focus, as you know, is on winning and being impactful. And I think it's going to be, uh, he's going to be a really helpful player during this stretch run in a way, again, that you would not expect of a 23 year old rookie. So the, the groin injury definitely threw a wrench in his season, right? Uh, you go, for like the first, I'll call it the first half of the year before the groin injury, he was shooting 51.3% overall, 50, uh, 35% on threes, on three attempts per game from three-point range. Since the groin injury in those nine games, he's gone from 51% shooting to 38.6% shooting. He's four of 24, so he's missed 20 of his last 24 three-pointers since coming back from the groin injury on, on, yeah. on, on slightly fewer attempts per game. I'm not worried about it. I don't no, care. I. Like I, I, guys go through slumps. Steph Curry goes through sl- shooting slumps. Like Clay Thompson goes through shooting slumps. Like so the greatest three point shooters we've ever seen have gone through them. I mean, Aka certainly isn't that, and I'm not comparing them to those players. But I, the the point being is that slumps happen. When he is finding other ways to contribute, whether it's passing the ball, you know, helping run that second unit, um, or you know, now with the new rotation, working off the ball in, um in that unit with Tyler Hero and Terry Rozier and Bam Adebayo, finding his place in a lineup that now includes Terry Rozier, all those things, that's what stands out to me. I like the rebounding numbers. I like defensively how he's gotten better this season. He has gotten better yes. as the year has gone on. Um, and, and he's finding a way to make an impact. I do think that they need to manage his minutes because I do think it's important to keep the rookie wall in the back of your mind, right? Because he's already right. played a full college season. Right. He's gone far and beyond what the full college season is. And you need this. Like, it's almost it's funny. We we praise how much of an instant impact he me, he has made on this team and how much he means to this team. But at the same time, a rookie means a lot to your rotation. And if you're the Miami Heat, you got to keep that in consideration. And we he's one of the guys, along with like Bam and Jimmy Butler and Tyler Hero, who we need fresh by the time the playoffs roll around. 
And so you got you, you can't have him playing 36 minutes a night or leading the team in fourth quarter minutes as much anymore. But I think yeah. the additions of guys like, obviously, Terry Rozier, re, uh, and then even more recently, DeLon Wright. Uh, DeLon Wright. Like those guys, maybe you, you're able to uh, you know sprinkle in some Haywood Highsmith minutes here or there, maybe some Nikola Jovic minutes in the right matchup. Like there's ways to keep those minutes down and make sure that Jaime is fresh for the for the playoffs. That's a, that's a good point. Um, you know, even just the in context of the All Star break, it, for him it really wasn't much of a break. Like he participated right. in the Rising Stars game, then in the Slam Dunk contest, and you're doing all the different events around town. So it's like he was that was a, a work uh, event for him more than anything else. So uh, you hope that he can take some time off and 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 be a, a part, you know, an important part of the stretch run. Uh, I, again, I think he will be, and I think they'll be able to manage those minutes, but you can't over rely on him either. But I think as, again, these guys that you brought in, so as, I think it's a really good point. And as Jimmy welcome is welcome back to the team, et cetera, you're going to find a way to manage his minutes a little bit more effectively and hopefully avoid a further injury or anything like that. Cause I think that that would be a concern if he was, you know, the, the groin injury, if it continues to be an issue, mm. you don't want it to flare up right before the season ends as you're entering the postseason. Cause then there would be that, that time where he needs to get back into a rhythm and find his comfort level again. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that stood out to me again, I, I bringing up the all-star break, but also in contrast with something that you wrote about in your piece is, that during the time he was at UCLA, he was so engrossed in his working and developing and becoming the player that he has become that his off the court interests, like building his brand and all that stuff, didn't really matter to him. And I kind of saw a different aspect of that. Like we've seen the hotels.com commercials, we've seen the recent profiles, not just yours on the ringer, but also on GQ Mexico. And, and like he didn't shy away from the bright spotlights of Indianapolis. Like he's there, you know, on a, a clip that went uh, viral. Like he's talking to Jennifer Hudson. He's on the slam dunk contest. He, it's not like he's opposed to being a star or getting that kind of recognition either. And, and again, he's got the, the movie star looks for it. Mm -hmm. uh, asked who he would, who would play him, which actor would play him in a biopic of his life. And, I, when I tell you that was an immediate response, you could tell that he's given it some thought. He said, Adam Driver, like, right. right <laughs> That's off the, perfect. Right off the bat, yeah, right off the bat, he said. So he's obviously thought about yeah. it, like, yeah, Adam Driver. And so it's like, that was hilarious. Um, so I just, I found that interesting. I, I, I do know. like that he's embracing the star part of it here. And yeah. he's very marketable for a lot of reasons. Yep. You mentioned that movie star looks, the hair, it's all very marketable. The dunk yeah. contest is good. Um, but the, the part of it too is like, he's not, He's not going to do that and not do the work. He's going to do the, right. the work. The, for him, right. the work comes first. The Heat are not opposed to star players. They love star players. They love Dwayne right. Wade. We're already going over. Anything else on this? I mean, there's, we could talk yeah, about this could, a lot. But, uh, read the, go read the story, people listening. I'll put a story in the show notes. Also, uh, David's interview with Jaime is going to go up on the audio-only platform. So if you listen to the show on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Odyssey or any other uh, podcast app, the interview will be up there as well. So make sure you go listen to that. But for now, that'll do it. Thanks for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day.